Chapter 9 in our course MEC 410 on machine design. This week we're going to study spur gear design from the point of view of the forces and stresses that are on the gear teeth. We have six problems for you for homework that are shown here on this slide. In chapter 8 we discussed gear dimensions and kinematics. This time in chapter 9 we will discuss forces, torque, power, and stresses and material selection for spur gears. And when we get to chapter 10, we'll do the same for other types of gears. Recall we had this slide from chapter 8 where we discussed all of the kinematics of the gears. We had the pitch line speed formula, the gear ratio, the velocity ratio, which can be calculated in five different ways. And we had an important factor known as the diametral pitch, which can be calculated just from the number of teeth in either the gear or the pinion and divide out by its diameter. We're going to be using all of these formulas when we study forces. If we were to take a look at the forces, torque, and power in the gearing, we basically focus on the meshing between the pinion teeth and the gear teeth. And in the upper right corner, you see a diagram where we talk about a force called WT, which is the tangential force on the teeth. This might occur in this mechanism shown on the upper left where we have a pinion attached to a drive motor. And then we have the gear being driven by the pinion and the pinion through a flex coupling drives a roller for the driven machine. The torque is calculated by taking the power and dividing out by the angular velocity. And in English units, the torque is 63,000 divided by the RPM, where that 63,000 number comes from taking the power in horsepower the RPM and simply in revolutions per minute. And if you go through all of these numerical conversions, the 555 pound foot per second per horsepower times one revolution per two pi radians and such forth, you have string together all these numbers. That's how you get that the torque is 63,000 times the power over the RPM. And the torque in this case is measured in pound inches. And the RPM is just the speed measurement N. The tangential force occurs because the teeth are pushing each other, as you saw in the prior slide. But you also get a radial force where the pinion, which is driving the gear, pushes down radially on the gear. The torque is just the tangential force times the radius, and that's equal to the power over the speed. And we can calculate the tangential force because we can take the power and divide out by the diameter and the speed and multiply by two in that formula there on the right. And we then get that the tangential force with all of those conversion constants is 126,000 times the power divided by the speed times the diameter tangential force in pounds. When we study what's going on in the gear, we have to take into account the angle phi, which we defined in chapter eight as the pressure angle of the gear teeth. If we want to know what the radial force is, we can just take the tangential force, Wt, and multiply by the tangent of the pressure angle, phi. And if we want to know the normal force, we just take the tangential force and divide out by the cosine of the pressure angle. The pitch circle is not actually pointing to any exact place in the tooth, but it is where we are showing the uh, forces on the tooth. And the OD or outside diameter of the gear is something you can measure because that goes from flat to flat across the center of the gear. 
And to review the pressure angle and how it's uh, calculated, we have our two pitch circles for the two gear teeth. And we have our lines of centers that's shown, and the pitch circle has tangent line that's shown in blue, and that blue tangent line is perpendicular to the line of center of a gear. And then we take our base circle, and we draw another blue line that's tangent to the two uh, base circles. And if you see the angle that's formed by those two blue lines, that's the pressure angle. Now spur gear are remarkably efficient. And the power losses do depend on the rolling action between the gear teeth. But because the rolling action between gear teeth is incredibly smooth, losses of 1% or less per gear pair is common. And so when we calculate the forces and the torques and the power transfers in gear teeth, we completely ignore the losses for simplicity of the calculation. So here we show a practice problem. It says that a pair of spur gears with 20 degree full depth in volume of teeth transmits 7.5 horsepower, and that 20 degrees is the pressure angle. An opinion is mounted on the shaft of an electric motor operating at 1750 RPM. The pinion has 20 teeth, it has a diametral pitch of 12, which means the gear also has a diametral pitch of 12. And the gear has 72 teeth, and they want you to compute the following parameters. A, the rotational speed of the gear, all the way to I, the normal force acting on the teeth of each gear. And in order to show you a method that you can go step by step, A to K, and calculate all of these parameters, I made up a little spreadsheet for you. And in the gray filled area, it shows what the inputs to the problem are. And then in the bottom half of this slide, we're showing step by step how you actually calculate all of the parameters pitch line speed, which is the effective linear speed of the teeth as they go by, which is pi times the diameter of either the gear or the pinion times the speed of that component and divide by 12. That gets you the pitch line speed in feet per minute. And you can go all the way through the flow of this calculation and come out the bottom of with a normal force, Wn, which is Wt, divided by cosine phi. And that gets you the calculation for the normal force in pounds. Be advised if you're going to use Excel, phi has to be in radians or Excel is not going to get you the uh, right answer. In spur gear manufacturing, gears are made on large numerically controlled machine tools. There's three methods of production. One's called form milling in which a cutter in the shape of an intertooth space mills the large gears so that those cutters that you see in the lower left corners are essentially the mirror image of the gear teeth. There's then a process called shaping where a cutter reciprocates on a vertical spindle and mills the internal gears. And then there's an interesting process called hobbing in which both the cutter and the gear blank move together to form the gear. And this photograph actually is a photograph of a hobbing operation. Spur gear dimensions can be measured either functionally or analytically. If you measure them functionally, which is what's shown in the lower left-hand corner in what's called a double flank roll testing device, you basically use a master machine gear that rotates with the gear under test and you record deviations from perfect motion. The idea here being if the gear has been perfectly manufactured, it's gonna have a perfect smooth mating with this ideal gear called a master gear. And then there's the, what I call the brute force method, which is analytical. And in that case, you take direct measurements of the tooth pitch, the alignment, the profile, the root radius, the run out, basically anything you can actually measure by touching the surface of the gear with a gear probe, and that's shown in the lower right corner of this slide.
You have what's called a gear quality number, which depends on the type of machine where the gear is installed. This is table 9-5 from our textbook. And the basic idea is that the higher gear quality number, the cheaper and poorly machined that a gear is. So you use an A11 gear to run a cement mixer drum or a cement kiln, which is a pretty down and dirty process. And if you want a stunningly precise gear that you can put into a gyroscope, then you would want an A2 quality gear. And then the numbers in the middle are for varying precision type equipment. And the other thing you got to remember about these quality numbers is that if you want to run a gear pair at very high pitch line speed, you're going to also need to use a very high quality gear with a small quality number. And that's shown on the bottom. For example, if you want to go over 4,000 feet per minute of a pitch line speed, then you better use at least an A4 quality number or an A2 or an A3. In order to run gears at millions of revolutions, you have to use a hardening operation for the first thousand or a couple of thousand angstroms of thickness on the gear. You can either use through harden operation, which is used for machine tools and heavy duty speed reducers and transmissions, or you can do a process known as case hardening, which produces high hardness only in the surface layer of the gear teeth, which is actually usually enough to make the gear last a few million revolutions. This shows the allowable stress numbers for case hardened grade one steel materials in table 9-9. We'll get into what those numbers are used for uh, in later slides, but the general idea is that the bigger the number, the better, and the longer your gear is going to last. This table just tells you the basic HRC or Rockwell hardness numbers that will give you the uh, different numbers of allowable bending stress, SAT, and allowable contact stress, SAC. Bending stress in gear teeth is caused by the fact that the two teeth are in contact with each other and that the driving gear is pushing on the driven gear. You get a high contact stress where the teeth meet and a high bending stress at the root of the tooth. We generally understand bending stress as being due to a force times a moment. Contact stress is a resultant of two teeth actually hitting each other. And after millions and millions of engagement of these gear teeth, eventually they're going to break down in a process called pitting. A gentleman named Lewis was a researcher who proposed that a bending stress number would be equal to the tangential force WT times the PD, the diametral pitch of the tooth, and then you divide out by the face factor and a number that he called the Lewis form factor, which depends amongst other things on tooth form and pressure angle and diametric pitch. And it was basically a catch-all for a whole bunch of geometric factors that are in the gear teeth. Here we show how later researchers modified the Lewis equation to account for a stress concentrator at the fillet area of the tooth. And the stress concentration factor KT depends in turn on five more factors, which are tuned to the loading, the gear size, gear mesh alignment, the tooth impact, and the rigidity. And those are given names KO, KS, KM, KB, and KV. In this formulation of an equation for a bending stress number, we also sh show that the number is inversely proportional to the face width and a quantity called J, which is an empirical geometry factor, which is purely based on the number of teeth that are in the pinion and in the gear. Now, if you want to find a geometry factor of J, you look no further than figure 14 in our textbook. And it shows a series of curves in blue lines. And on the y-axis, you have the geometry factor. And on the x-axis, you have the number of teeth for which a geometry factor is desired. 
So the way you use this is you first find j for the pinion using the number of pinion teeth on the x-axis, and then you use whichever of those uh, blue curves applies or closest applies to the number of gear teeth. And then if the gear teeth is not shown, because again, there's only two, four, six blue lines that are shown, you interpolate between the blue lines to find the closest value. You can then find the geometry factor j for the gear using the number of gear teeth on the x-axis, and then you use whichever of those blue lines corresponds to the number of pinion teeth. You find that intersection between an x-coordinate, one of the blue lines, and then you read across, suppose it was 60 gear teeth and 17 on the pinion. You then read across to the left and you find where your y-axis point is. So in this case, you'd have a geometry factor j for the gear of 0.40 you have to find an overload factor, k sub zero, which you use table 9-1 to do. And it depends on two basic factors, what your power source is like, either uniform, light shock, or moderate shock. And it depends on what the driven machine is like, either uniform, light shock, moderate, or heavy shock. You basically look at the problem formulation and you ask yourself, what of three types of power source do you have? Say an electric motor or a gas turbine or a multi-cylinder engine, that gets you the power source. And you look at all these types of machines that are in the definitions for driven machine and you find which of those is closest to the machine that you're trying to design a gear pair for. You have a size factor, Ks, which you get from table 9-2, which really just depends on your diametral uh, pitch. If you have a diametral pitch PD of five or greater, and most gears have that, then you just get a size factor of one. You have to find a load distribution factor, K sub n, where K sub n depends on the alignment of your gear teeth with each other when the machine is in operation. And if you have inaccurate gear teeth or a lot of misalignment, you're going to get one value of low distribution factor Km. And if you have very good clearances, not a lot of elastic deformations, and really well-defined and crowned gear teeth, you're going to get the opposite extreme of a load distribution factor. Now the load distribution factor itself depends on two empirically defined factors. Cp, which is a pinion proportional factor, Cpf that is, and Cma, which is a factor known as the mesh alignment factor. First, how to find Cpf. It basically depends on what's the face width f, which is your X coordinate, and then you take the face width and divide out by the pinion diameter d sub p, and that gets you on one of these four brown lines. And then you intersect where you are on the x coordinate with one of the brown lines, and you read across to the y coordinate, and wherever you intersect the y axis, that's your pinion proportion factor cp of f. Or can, you can use the equation shown on the right side of the slide to be a little more precise. Our mesh alignment factor depends on which of these four types of descriptions of gear units that you are uh, using, where a gyroscope would use an extra precision enclosed gear units and a, something like a cement mixer might use open gearing, meaning the gears are literally exposed to atmosphere. And then you take the uh, face width as the x-coordinate, find whichever brown line you intersect with, read over to the left, and on your y-coordinate, that gets you your mesh alignment factor, CMA. And then you calculate Km is equal to be 1 plus these two factors, CPF and CMA. You have a rib thickness factor, Kb, which depends on the rigidity of the internal web of the gear teeth 
Shown on the left is an old-fashioned wooden gear, which had a lot of holes in it, and the uh, gear literally would bend internally due to the force on the teeth. And shown on the upper right is more of a, a modern idea for taking away a little metal uh, uh, out of the gear and lightening it up, where you're taking a little bit of material out, but not enough to appreciably make the gear deform when the pinion rotates it. And you have a number called the backup ratio, MB, which is equal to the rim thickness divided by the hole depth of the gear. And depending on that number, you're going to calculate what the rim thickness KB is for this chart in the lower left corner. If you have a solid gear, which is typical in our homework problems, then KB just equals 1. You have a dynamic load factor, KV, which accounts for the impact of the teeth on each other when meshing. Lower values of KV are obtained with the more accurately machined teeth, those with the small quality numbers. And KV also goes up as the pitch line velocity increases due to increased magnitude of vibrations on the gear set. Your formula KV is equal to a number C divided by C times the square root of the pitch line velocity and all that to the negative B power. B and C are calculated from these two formulas, which I'm showing you uh, with my mouse. And if you do that math, you're going to get a number to use for dynamic load factor KV. Or you can use this graphical chart where you take whichever curve is the one corresponding to your gear quality number. And this chart showing from 6 to 12. You then take your pitch line velocity on the x-axis, read across, find the value that corresponds to the gear quality number, read across to the left, and that gives you graphically your dynamic factor KV. Our procedure to find the bending stress number ST in gears goes like this. The basic idea is to use equation 916 for a bending stress number and find WT, PDF, FJ, and our five different K factors. And so step two, which is really the first detail step, is to find the pitch line velocity, V sub t. PD is fairly easy to find. You can use equation A3. F, the face width, is usually given. You find geometry factor J from figure 910, an overload factor KO from the table 91, a size factor KS from table 92, we showed you before how to find the load distribution factor, Km, and the, and the rim thickness factor, Kb. We then have our dynamic factor, Kv, which you can either use your equations or you can interpolate in the figure 9-16. String all the numbers together in step 11, and then you get a bending stress number. So here's an example of how you do that. A bending stress number in gear teeth needs to be calculated in problem number 36. You have a pair of gears with 20 degrees full depth in volume with teeth transmitting 10 horsepower. The pinion is rotating at 1750 RPM. The diametral pitch is 12. The quality number is A11. The pinion has 8 teeth. The gear is 85 teeth. The face width is 1.25 inches. We've got power from an electric motor, the drive is for an industrial conveyor, and the drive is a commercial enclosed gear unit. We summarize in this chart at the bottom all of the inputs that are going to go into our Excel spreadsheet. So we can find VT, the pitch line speed, from equation 9-1, and then WT from equation 9-9. PD in this problem was given to us as 12. So that was easy. And F was given to us as 1.25 inches. We can find geometry factor J from figure 9-14. J for the pinion is roughly 0.3 because the pinion had 17 teeth and the gear has 85 teeth. 
and we can find JG for the 85 tooth gear as roughly 0.42 because on the x-axis we find by interpolation roughly the number 85. Conveniently we have a blue line for 17 teeth and we read across and that's how we get over here 0.42. To find the overload factor K0, we were told the input comes from an electric motor, which is a uniform power source. And we were told that the industrial conveyor is our driven machine. And in our definitions, it turns out that if we look right here, we have heavy duty conveyor, which is what an industrial conveyor is, heavy duty. And According to our chart here, that's a style of moderate shock. So with moderate shock on as a column and uniform as a row, we get K sub zero, the overload factor is 1.5. Our diametral pitch is 12, which is certainly greater than five. So we have a size factor KS of one. For our load distribution factor KM, first we have to find CPF we had a face width of only 1.25, so that's here where my mouse is. And if we divide the face width by the pinion diameter, we get a number that's very close to 1. And then we read across and we find that our pinion proportion factor, CP of F, is roughly here at about 0.06. Or we, of course, we could use this calculation here, get an exact number. It is a commercial enclosed gear unit, we're told. And therefore, we use this second most from the bottom brown curve. The face width, again, is only one and an eighth. And so we have a mesh alignment factor. That's a 0.147, it turns out, reading across. And that gets us KM, our load distribution factor of 1.208, if we happen to calculate it with the formulas given. The gear blank is solid, and so M sub B is much greater than 1.2, and hence KB, the rim thickness, is 1. We can either calculate our dynamic factor KV using the formula that I show here on the top side of the slide and the input values from B and C. Or we can take the fact that our pinch line velocity V sub T is around 700. We do have AV equals 11 by definition and we read across we find KV graphically looks close to 1.35, but calculated mathematically, it's exactly 1.35. And if we multiply all these numbers out, we obtain a bending stress number for the pinion of 37,604, which is much bigger than the bending stress number for the gear. This is actually the general qualitative difference that you're gonna see in all these problems where the pinion always has a higher bending stress number than the gear. And the reason that happens is the geometry factor J is the big difference. It's always gonna be a smaller number for the pinion than it is for the gear. The bending stress number for the pinion is always gonna be bigger numbers than the gear. And as such, most calculations for the bending stress number, which eventually is going to get used to figure out how much hardness we need in the pinion and the gear, uh, can be done solely for the pinion because it's essentially the worst case condition. The other thing about hardness is that you would never, in a practical manufacturing operation, make the pinion a different hardness from the gear because the way case hardening operations are really done is first you machine all the pinions and the gears and then you put them in a thermal and gas chamber and run the actual case hardening operation as a batch operation. Here's the full solution in Excel to problem 9-36 showing you step by step how you do all the calculations. Well, now we're going to show you an iterative procedure to select the appropriate grades of steel and the hardness for 
bending stress in a gear. So in this calculation, what we do is we use equations 924A and 925 in our book, and we specify a Brunel hardness of the steel that solves these two equations. The first one is ST, the bending stress number, has to be a smaller number than SAT prime, which is the allowable bending stress number modified for loading cycle safety factor and reliability. And SAT prime, in turn, depends on SAT, the allowable bending stress number that we're going to get directly from graphs that define hardness, how it relates to a bending stress number. And you multiply by Y sub N, a bending stress cycle factor, and divide out by a safety factor and KR reliability factor. The more number of cycles that you want the gear to run, the better a gear material you're going to need to use. And the more of a safety factor that you want in your operation, and the higher the reliability you want, the better a gear material hardness that you're going to need in order to handle the stresses that are going to be in the gear. So you find a recommended design life and hours from table 912, which basically tells you how long your machines that use the gear can be expected to run. Or you may have a design specification for your machine that tells you exactly how many hours these gears are going to have to run. You then can calculate a number of gear stress cycles from equation 9-27, where NC is the expected number of cycles of loading. You multiply by L, the design life in hours, by N, the rotational speed of the gear in RPM, and by Q, the number of load applications per revolution. Now Q is going to be 1 for spur gears, but there are certain gear configurations, such as planetary gears, where one gear may contact a number of other gears, typically three or four in planetary gears, for each one rotation of itself. And in that case, for the planetary gears, the gear that's in the middle driving the other three or four gears would get a Q number of either three or four, depending on how many gears are in orbital revolution around the one uh, central gear. You find the bending strength stress cycle factor Y sub N using figure 9-21, and you find the reliability factor K sub R from table 9-11. You take a guess at initial value of Brunel hardness and calculate S sub AT. You then use equation 925 to find SAT prime, and then you see, using equation 924, if your previously calculated bending stress number is less than SAT prime. And if yes to equation 924, you can lower the Brunel hardness in steps of 20 until you barely satisfy the equation and then you're done. And if no to this inequality, ST less than SAT prime, you have to increase the Brunel hardness and try again. And the reason I recommend steps of 20 is that you need to give yourself a little bit of safety factor in just what the brittle hardness is because the reality of steels is that no one can measure a Brunel hardness with a tolerance of one or two. Typically the tolerance in the measurements of what the hardness of a steel is can be up to about 20. So this table 912 gives you some recommended design life for different types of machines. The critical equipment machines in 24-hour operation might go anywhere from 100,000 to 200,000 hours. A cheap, a cheap domestic appliance, like a blender, might only go 1,000 to 2,000 hours. So you can use these numbers as guidelines and pick the midpoint, or you can use a, a number of hours that relates to the design spec of the machine if one is given. And here's how we use figure 9-21 to find the factor Y sub N. If the number of load cycles is greater than uh, 5 times 10 to the 6, note that it's a logarithmic curve on the x-axis, there's only one curve for Y sub N, 
which basically tells you that for a certain number of cycles you read up and then you read across and that gets you your stress cycle factor y sub n is typically a number less than one. If you're not going to use your machine very much and you're going to use different types of uh, these materials and four examples are shown, you can then get factors y sub n which are greater than one which will usually allow you to use a cheaper grade of steel for the gear and the pinion because you weren't really planning on using your gear and pinion that much anyway. Your reliability factor k sub r is a larger number. If you want to have excellent and low, that is, probability of failure, k sub r is 1.5 if you want to have virtual perfection, chance of only one failure in 10,000, then it's 0.85 if you want to have one in 10 odds, if you feel like a betting mind. Personally, I would not recommend anything of a KR uh, less than one, because one in 10 odds is not very good to determine if your machine is uh, going to fail or not. This use of figure 918 gets you your allowable bending stress number, SAT. And the idea is that there's two curves, one for grade 1 steel, one for grade 2 steel. And what the Brinell hardness is on the x-axis defines what the allowable bending stress number is on the y-axis. For example, if you have Brinell hardness of 300, you intersect with this blue curve either for grade one or grade two, and you read across to the y-axis, and that gets you a number in KSI. Note that KSI means thousands of PSIs, and that gets you what the number SAT is. Grade two steel is more expensive than grade one, so for a given Brunel hardness of grade two steel, you're going to get a higher uh, number SAT. In our homework problems, sometimes they're open-ended and they don't really tell you whether it's grade one or grade two. Usually what I try to do in uh, exams and what I will do in the uh, grading for our homework is I will tell you whether to use grade one or grade two a steel so that it makes it clear there's only one right answer on this chart. So here is a Another practice homework problem. It's problem number 42, which is going to use data from problem 36 that we already generated. And we're going to design a pair of gears for reliability of 0.99 and a design life of 20,000 hours. And our goal is to use a service factor SF of 1.0 and find out which Brunel hardness we need for either grade 1 or grade 2 that will allow our gears with the forces and speeds that were defined in problem 36 have a reliability of 0.99 and work for a design life of 20,000 hours. So here is just a broader summary of our input requirements. We've added the 0.99 which is 99% reliability. Q is equal to 1 and L the uh, design life is 20,000 hours. Our problem specified 20,000 hours so presumably it's some type of electric motor, industrial blower, some general purpose industrial machine. If we were to multiply out 60 times L times N sub P which is the number of teeth on the pinion times Q we get 2.1 times 10 to the 9th cycles for the pinion, which is way out here on the right side of the chart. You read up, and we find that y sub n is 0.93, or you can calculate y sub n from this formula shown. Kr is 1, because we wanted 99% reliability. We're going to take a first guess using grade 1 hb equals 200 using figure 9-18 for the allowable bending stress number SAT. And then we can figure out either graphically 
that roughly our uh, SAT number would be around 29 KSI, or we can use this formula on the bottom to analytically find SAT. And here we're showing in our Excel spreadsheet what the results were using grade one steel HB equal to 200. And we had already calculated the bending stress number for the pinion at 37.6 KSI and the bending stress number for the gear at 26.9. And we find, using our formula SAT prime equal to SAT times YN divided by the product of SF and KR, that a required allowable bending stress for the pinion S prime ATP is 26.1 KSI, and that for the gear is 26.9. Well, this is a very marginal situation because you have a scenario where the gear is satisfied that you've got a required allowable bending stress number equal to the bending stress number for the gear. But for the pinion, the 26.1 is less than the 37.6. So that means that your gear is probably going to hold up over 20,000 hours, but your pinion won't. So you're going to need to go with a larger value of HB so that we can make the gear and pinion out of the same grade of steel. So we try another value of hardness HB in our spreadsheet. And this time, what we get is that the pinion 37.6 allowable bending stress number is almost exactly equal to the bending stress number. And the gear has plenty of surplus, where 38.6 is much greater than 26.9. But that's still a little marginal because you really don't want a situation where you're relying on the perfection of this calculation to make a machine last for 20,000 hours. So in this case, I'd recommend adding 20 to the value of HB in your spreadsheet. And when you do that, you find the pinion at 39 is greater than the bending stress number for the pinion of 37.6. The hardness HB was 380, and you're in pretty good situation. Note that the worst case situation is for the pinion as predicted, because the gear at 40.1 KSI has a required allowable bending stress number that is much bigger than the actual bending stress number in the gear of 26.9. Here's just a full solution to the problem. Now we're going to get into the analogous calculation that you do for contact stress. And recall that contact stress occurs because the mating teeth are repeatedly hitting each other at very high rates. Prolonged contact stresses lead to a degradation of the teeth called pitting. Pitting starts out as microcracks on the surface of a gear tooth. And eventually those cracks propagate to the internal parts of the teeth. And you see that in this photo on the left of one gear tooth. And on the right, you see for a very large gear, significant material loss on each gear tooth. You can see why it looks like pitting because it, it looks like someone took a chisel and started chiseling out the teeth of the gear and putting big pits in it. So in theory, two teeth hit exactly on a line, but in practice, gears are elastic and the tooth shape deforms slightly when the gears touch each other. And the tangential force is transmitted on a very small rectangular area of the gear. And wherever that small area of the gear is, is going to be where the gear has a risk of pitting. So a gent named Hertz created a contact stress formula for two solid objects. And he showed that formula here on the top of the slide where sigma sub C is the contact stress. And it's a function of material properties such as the modulus of elasticity of the first body and the second body and Poisson's ratio for these two bodies. And he also postulated that the stress was related to the radius of the curvature for the first and second surfaces. 
and it was related to the contact force. Later researchers took his basic theory and applied it to spur gears. And they calculated sigma c, the contact stress, as equal to cp, a material-related constant shown with the formula on the right, times the square root of the tangential force, wt, divided by the product of the face width, the pinion pitch diameter, and a geometry factor called i, which was the geometry factor for pitting, where i depends on the pressure angle, the gear ratio, and the number of teeth in the pinion. Using our factors for overload, size factor, load distribution factor, and dynamic factor, we can use the Hertz contact stress formula to to evaluate a very accurate contact stress number. S sub C is the contact stress number. CP is our elastic coefficient. And besides depending on the tangential force, the face width, and the pinion pitch diameter, and I, the geometry factor, we also have our four Ks, our overload factor, size factor, load distribution factor, and dynamic factor to consider. To find the geometry factor of I, you just use the gear ratio on the x-axis, which you know, and you measure up until you find the blue curve that corresponds to the number of teeth n sub p on the pinion. And then you read across to the left and you find your geometry factor. And if you don't find the blue curve that relates exactly to the number of teeth on your pinion, you just interpolate between two curves. We use equation 923 and find answers for all of our variables that are in this formula for CP and the other one from SC. And we use that to find the contact stress number SC in the gears. And in particular, uh, the pinion again is going to be the uh, one of the pinion gear pair that dominates our decision for what type of gear material that we need to use to guarantee that we're not going to get into pitting. And we find values either graphically or numerically for WT, KO, KS, KM, KV, F, and DP for our bending stress number procedure. And here's an example of how we actually find our contact stress number in a gear and make a decision on what type of hardness we need. We do have analogous formula to our bending stress situation, but this time we have to show that the contact stress number S sub C is less than SAC prime, the allowable contact stress number modified for loading cycles, safety factor, and reliability. And in particular, we have Z sub n, a contact stress cycle factor that's analogous to Y sub n, the bending stress cycle factor, but we're going to use different equations and or a different graphical chart to uh, find it. And we also have different graphs to find SAC, the allowable contact stress number, which is the one that depends on the Brunel hardness and also has grade one and grade two steels and it's it's found using figure 9-19. Our recommended procedure to find the design life in hours and calculate the number of gear stress cycles is the same as for bending stress and as well as our process of finding the reliability factor k sub r. You take a guess at an initial value of Brunel hardness, and you see how you do in equation 924b to see if your previously calculated value of SC, the contact stress number, is less than SAC prime. And if yes to that formula, you can lower the Brunel hardness value in steps of 20 until you barely satisfy the equation. And if no, you're going to have to increase the Brunel hardness and try again. 
Now you're going to get different numbers for Brunel hardness to satisfy requirements for bending and contact stresses. Because the pinion and gear must survive both stresses, you have to select whichever hardness value is larger. So here's our figure 922 to find factor z sub n. It's a little simpler than finding y sub n because even at values less than 10 to the 7 cycles, which is a bunch, that's actually 10 million. Now you only got two choices of z sub n factors uh, that you use. And our way of finding which hardness to specify for contact stress number is similar to what we had for the bending stress number, but the curves are slightly different and the actual numbers for allowable contact stress are much higher values and actually the grade one and two curves are closer together. And so you can either do it graphically where a Brunel hardness number is read off the x-axis, hits either the grade one or two curve and then go over to the y-axis, or you can use these analytical formula that are shown for grade one or two steel. And here's a practice problem where you can see how we use the method for calculating a required allowable contact stress number. And in this formulation, we're going to use a service factor SF of 1.0. And we're going to use data that we've previously calculated in problems 36 and 42 to be able to calculate this answer here in problem 54. So there's a lot of data we can input from prior formulations here in problem 54. And all those input pieces of data are shown here in this slide. It's a little easier to find geometry factor i because we know our gear ratio is roughly 4.8. We then also know that NP is 18, which is a little bit over 16 and a good amount less than 24. So we interpolate, we find the center of this red circle. We move across to the Y axis and we estimate a geometry factor I of 0.106. We have a very large number of pinion cycles, 2.1 times 10 to the ninth, which using either the graphical method or analytical formulas get us a contact stress cycle factor Zn of 0.88 for the pinion. And then we hit a massive roadblock. We calculated our contact stress number at 175.8. And we tried to use grade two steel HB equals 400, which was the best steel that we had in our chart to calculate a required allowable contact stress number for the pinion. And we only got 139.6. Now we're in trouble. We can't use either the grade one or grade two material. So the only thing we can do in this gear design to satisfy the requirement that S prime ACP be a bigger number than S sub C is to start changing the geometry of the gear itself. And the most common way to do that is to use a larger face width F. Or you can use a larger pinion pitch diameter D sub P. But of course, those are not free solutions. If you use the larger face with F or the larger pinion pitch diameter DP, what happens here in this equation for SC is that they're living in the denominator and then your contact stress number is going to go down. But now what happens is your gears just got physically bigger. Because if you use a larger face with F for the pinion, you have to use the same value for the gear. And if the gear ratio is fixed and you use a larger pinion pitch diameter D sub P for the pinion, now all of a sudden you have to use a larger gear pitch diameter. Now it means you're taking up more space inside your transmission case for the gear system. Now if you've got the space, then it's not a problem. 
then you can make the both the pinion and the gear physically larger. But if you don't have the space, it's probably back to the drawing board and take a look at your basic machine design. The next likely parameter you could adjust is this number L, which is the number of hours that you want your machine to run. If you go with a smaller value of L, significantly smaller value, then the pinion number of cycles NCP gets uh, a lot smaller than Z sub N will get bigger and then your required allowable contact stress for the pinion becomes a bigger number. The other thing you might do is some combination of the uh, three actions that we just discussed in order to get yourself out of this tough situation. So here's our full solution to the problem showing all the different parameters that we calculated. And that's all I have to show for this presentation. Any questions on the homework? Let me know. Thanks.